Hey, Redcon Raider here. I know I've been talking about Phoenix Point a lot lately, but that's just because I'm a huge fan of turn-based tactical games. And Phoenix Point is the latest project I've started following, but it's hardly the only turn-based game I've ever followed. So today I thought I'd switch tracks a bit and talk about Fallout Van Buren, the original Fallout 3 that was planned by Interplay, before the license was doled out to Bethesda. I'm a big fan of the Fallout franchise in general, and I've had a particular fascination with the cancelled Fallout games. Now, obviously, any fan of the franchise has already heard about Van Buren. There are tons of articles and videos out there that touch on it, but few of them really look at the game in depth. I think that's a real shame considering that, despite being cancelled, there's a ton of information available about what was planned for the game. You see, although Van Buren was cancelled in 2003, Black Isle Studios had already completed a significant amount of design and development for the game. Bethesda's official stance was that they had no intention of releasing any of the unfinished assets for the game, but then in 2007, a copy of the in-house tech demo and several screenshots were leaked to the Fallout fan site No Mutants Allowed. This was soon followed by over 700 pages of design documents, giving an incredible amount of new information about the cancelled project. As if that weren't already enough, this was further supplemented by the tireless efforts of the folks at The Vault, who extracted even more information from the files included with the tech demo, which included over a thousand lines of dialogue planned for use in the game. So my plans are to start combing through all of these files so I can present them in clear, concise videos that will give you an idea of what we might have seen in the Fallout game we never got to play. But first, let's start by talking about the game's mechanics. Aside from the story, there were several planned mechanics that would have set Van Buren apart from the previous two games in the series. First, and perhaps most obvious, is the fact that this game was the first Fallout title that was going to be developed in a fully 3D engine, the Jefferson Engine, which was designed by Black Isle for use in developing the also-canceled Baldur's Gate 3 project. This was actually the second attempt to develop a Fallout game in 3D, with the previous attempt having been done using the NDL 3D technology that was instead used to produce Icewind Dale, and then later acquired by Gamebryo to develop Bethesda's Fallout 3. Second, and perhaps just as obvious, is the fact that the game was being developed with a hybrid action system. The developers were trying to focus on the turn-based combat system, but they also implemented a real-time-with-pause action system similar to the one featured in Fallout Tactics. You see, at the time, Interplay was pushing Black Isle Studios to start leaning toward producing more action-oriented games, which is what resulted in the hybrid system seen in Fallout Tactics, as well as the entirely action-oriented spin-off games such as Fallout Brotherhood of Steel and another cancelled game, Fallout Extreme. On top of that, Fallout Van Buren was going to include a cooperative multiplayer system, again at the behest of the higher-ups at Interplay. It was a mechanic that had been included in some of Black Isle Studios' previous games, such as the Baldur's Gate franchise and Icewind Dale, and they felt that it would increase the sales of Van Buren. Beyond those obvious changes, there were several smaller additions or tweaks to pre-existing mechanics. One of the bigger additions was vehicle functionality. Fallout 2 had dabbled with player-owned vehicles in Fallout 2 back in 1998 with the Highwaymen. This was a car that the player could purchase and modify for use when traveling on the world map, but it was largely just an abstract tool that didn't actually function once you loaded into a map location. Fallout Tactics in 2001 was the first game to introduce vehicles that you could actually use in turn-based combat. It appears that Fallout Van Buren was planning to follow in Tactics' footsteps and include a variety of vehicles that the player would be able to acquire, build, repair, and upgrade to help them in their quest. We don't have a lot of details on exactly how these would have functioned, but it's strongly implied that there would be elements of vehicular combat, as evidenced by concept art showing things like this, a motorized chariot that would have been used by Caesar's Legion. In addition, vehicles would have served multiple in-game functions. For example, one of the vehicles that the player would be able to acquire was a truck with a trailer that could be converted into a mobile science bay, making it much easier to craft and repair scientific items while traveling around the map. Yes, that's right, aside from the vehicles, Van Buren was also intended to officially introduce an actual, full-fledged crafting system to the franchise, 
As you can see in this leaked screenshot, the player would have been able to craft all sorts of equipment, including ammo, armor, chems, tools, and weapons. The player would do this by gathering resources through scavenging or by breaking down items in their inventory, learning schematics through reverse engineering, quests, or perks, and then crafting them with the specialized equipment or facilities such as the Mobile Science Bay. If this sounds familiar, it's probably because it's very similar to the system that ended up being introduced in Fallout 4. Clearly, someone at Bethesda was paying attention to at least some of the features that were originally going to be introduced into the Fallout franchise as far back as 2003. In addition, this crafting system would have been used to gate extremely powerful equipment that only the most well-trained science boys would have been able to create. The game was going to feature several top-secret projects designed by Poseidon Energy for use by the Department of Defense, but which had never made it past the prototype stage by the end of the Great War. This included the Artemis Railgun, the Apollo Laser Pistol, the Athena Power Armor, the Heracles Power Fist, the Hermes Combat Armor, and the Nemean Subdermal Implant. Which, of course, brings us to combat. Now, aside from the hybrid action system, combat was largely unchanged from the first two games, with the big exception that the developers were introducing a new fatigue system. This would have added a new layer to combat, allowing for characters to be knocked out rather than just killed, promoting greater possibilities for full pacifist runs. Fatigue would have counted upwards, being accrued as a character was hit with certain types of attacks, such as cattle prods, drug darts, or certain gases. Damage blocked by armor would have also been partially converted into fatigue damage, and certain strenuous actions, such as coming down from chems or making unarmed combo attacks, would have also caused additional fatigue buildup. Once a character's fatigue exceeded a certain level, they would fall unconscious, allowing the player time to loot their body, interact with other nearby objects, run away, or even, theoretically, capture them. Similarly, the developers wanted to enhance the functionality of unarmed combat, making it a more appealing skill for combat hounds. To this end, they wanted to introduce the idea of unarmed combos, which would allow the player to chain together several special punch and kick attacks that would hinder foes with status effects and heftier fatigue damage. Aside from the introduction of fatigue, there were several other tweaks to the familiar special system, many of them brainstormed by Josh Sawyer himself. Several skills were moved around, with big guns, small guns, and energy weapons being combined into a single catch-all firearm skill, speech being split into separate deception and persuasion skills, first aid and doctor being combined into a single medic skill, lockpicking and traps being combined into a single security skill, and both throwing and gambling skills being cut from the game entirely. Likewise, there were several tweaks to the character traits, with the addition of two new traits, one in a million and Red Scare, and the removal of four other traits, including Heavy Handed, Jinxed, the entirely cosmetic Bloody Mess, and the largely useless Sex Appeal. Perks were going to be heavily reimagined, and sadly that's one of the areas of the game's development that we just don't have a whole lot of information on. The plan was to change it so that perks were no longer tied to the character's level, instead being gated by the player's attributes and skills. They also were planning on downplaying boring perks that just gave flat statistical bonuses, instead focusing on introducing perks that would act as actual game changers, theoretically altering the way you play the game one small bit at a time. Body Snatcher, for example, is a deception-based perk that would have granted the player the ability to craft costumes from items looted off of defeated enemies. Once a costume was complete, the player would be able to sneak much more efficiently through certain areas, or even gain access to content that was otherwise impossible to encounter. Similarly, the Eye on the Prize perk would have allowed the player to see what was in a container without actually having to open it, allowing them to better plan their looting sprees, or to better decide whether it was worth robbing some poor NPC in a neutral settlement. Of course, in regards to perks, you'll note that this is indeed the philosophy that Obsidian took when developing New Vegas, which embraced the idea of perks which were designed to act as a miniature game-changer, rather than flat statistical bonuses. This is no coincidence, given that Josh Sawyer was spearheading the new perk system for Van Buren, and also acted as the project director and lead designer on New Vegas. It also appeared that Black Isles intended to revamp the companion system in Van Buren, to make it a little bit more realistic. For one thing, injuries would have directly impacted how a companion performed in combat. They would flee once they reached a certain threshold, but the player would have been able to theoretically overcome this with the use of the new Suicide King perk. 
Companions would have also been more independent, more commonly voicing their opinions or acting against the player's instructions. The Hanged Man, for example, was a potential companion who would have had great attributes and abilities, but would have also been tremendously evil, often goading NPCs towards violence or butchering people he disliked, and constantly getting the player into problematic situations. There were at least a dozen different companions planned for the final game, most of them intrinsically tied to a specific faction or location, and with their own involvement in major storyline events. And that brings us to what is perhaps one of the most significant, but often overlooked, changes. With Van Buren, Black Isle Studios was taking a new approach to how they designed content for the game. As outlined in the Tibbetts Area Design Document, the developers were supposed to consider the four main character archetypes when designing quests or areas. Each of these archetypes was defined by the skills the player might focus on, including the Combat Boy archetype, the Charisma Boy archetype, the Science Boy archetype, and the Stealth Boy archetype. The goal was to make sure that, regardless of build, a player would always have some sort of reactive content that was available to their specific character build. This also extended to some other aspects of the character's development, with designers being instructed to also keep things like karma, reputation, companions, special attributes, and specific skills in mind when developing reactive content. Reactivity tends to be a pretty common buzzword in modern game design, but it seems to have been a concept that the developers for Van Buren were truly taking to heart. Now, that's all I'm going to go into in this video, but I think it gives a pretty good overview of most of the new features that were planned for Van Buren before it was cancelled in 2003. Next time, I'll focus on giving a good overview of the game's main storyline. There seems to be a common misconception that Fallout New Vegas essentially recycles the plot that was originally planned for Van Buren. And as near as I can tell, this simply isn't true. Yes, there are a few minor elements of Van Buren that made it into New Vegas, but by and large, New Vegas appears to draw more from the planned sequel to Van Buren, the also-canceled Fallout 4, that Black Isles would have started development on if Van Buren had ever been completed. But like I said, I'll get into that next time. Until then, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. And remember, I do love talking about Fallout Van Buren, and the Fallout games in general, but if you want to check out the truly exhaustive amount of information available for yourself, then be sure to visit the Fallout wikis to find out more. Links are in the description.